Welcome to this presentation on the modernism and postmodernism, uh, and th this will be a, a brief presentation on these two isms, focusing on literature and some art. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please use the question uh, field down below or comment field down below. Uh, or if you have any suggestions or other things you would like me to give you a lecture on, feel free. However, modernism and postmodernism, that's where we are today. Uh, modernism it was said by Brian Appleyard that modernism may be seen as an attempt to reconstruct the world in the absence of God. And modernism, and we're talking early 20th century, followed a period, uh, in, especially in literature, that was uh, called realism. And realistic authors and artists, they wanted to show the world as it was. And we have examples such as Charles Dickens in, in Great Britain uh, writing about the awfulness of being an orphan, etc., etc., uh, and it was meant to feel real to the to the audience reading this or um, looking at art. It was supposed to to look as though you could touch more or less the things you you saw. Then we have a great catastrophe in the early twentieth century. We have the Great World War. Uh, now we're called, now we're talking about World War One. And what happened there was well, of course, it was extremely destructive, and, and people died, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but another thing happened that we got new into social structures. Uh, in the trenches, especially, uh, it didn't really matter which uh, social class you belonged to, you were still in there. Well, working class or upper class, it didn't matter. And this way, people got together and started talking over class uh, structures and social structures. Uh, which, of course, has developed ideas, etc., etc. What this had to do with, with realism and, and modernism is that uh, also in this First World War, we have photography, so people could actually see what the war looked like. Authors and artists, especially artists perhaps, they were starting to thinking about what is truth? How can art and literature show truth? And we have photography, and this is a photograph of um, a trench. We have a dead German lying in a trench, and this has just been taken, this trench has been taken. Uh, and we have very, very realistic pictures, and the artists and, and people in general were talking, were wondering, is this, is this war? Is this how it really felt? Is this the truth when it comes to war? This does not really portray how war feels or felt. This is the starting point for modernists. And we have Picasso, for instance, who is a very well-known modernist, and um, he painted this very famous picture, Guernica, uh, based on, on the bombing of the Spanish city, Guernica, in 1936, uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And what he portrayed with this picture, it is not realistic at all. Uh, it's extremely modernist. Uh, and it was not supposed to tell you or show you how it looked, but it's supposed to give you a feeling of how it felt. And as you perhaps do feel when you see this picture, you can feel the chaos, the screaming, the pain. Uh, and, and this was what the modernists wanted you to experience, more or less. Not what it looked like, but how it felt. And they wanted their art and literature to, to portray that. I'm going to give you a little modernist checklist. So if you are reading something or watching something or taking a look at a nice picture, uh, you can perhaps decide whether or not it is modernist. Um, this is, of course, not perhaps a full checklist. So, well, please don't kill me if you feel that there are things missing here. Uh, one thing that modernists like, and of course, you don't have to follow all of these uh, 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 piece of literature or something does not have to have all of this involved just to be modernist. But modernists generally like to have multiple points of view. You can have a story written from different perspectives uh, so that you don't only follow one person. Or, or so. Another thing a lot of modernist writers, to be honest here, uh, like uh, is to have no chronology or fragmentation, so that you do not have a story starting from A, going through B, and then ending up at C, but maybe you start at C, and you look back at A, and then you go to, uh, to B, and then perhaps you end up again at A or C. Um, and you leave out parts of the story. Some parts of the story 
uh, will be written between the lines so that you have to think when you read this or watch something. Um, and again, it has to do with fragmentation in a sense too, is that you have gaps. So part of the story, parts of the story will, will not be there. You have to fill it in yourself. Some modernists have a sort of uncertainty about language, wondering about words. What do words mean? Can you include words that aren't really words? And uh, can you play around with language in a sense? And something very modernist, and, and we have Virginia Woolf and James uh, Joyce using this a lot, is stream of consciousness, writing as though you are thinking something. Um, you can recognize this if you see a page, chapter, or even a whole book in one case, without any punctuation at all. Uh, because that is how you think. You think without punctuation. You don't fill in full stops, etc. and you think. And this is something that, for instance, James Joyce wanted to, to illustrate with writing. For instance, Molly Bloom's uh, monologue in the last part of Ulysses famous book from, from uh, 1923, if I don't remember incorrectly. Um, we have writers such as Franz Kafka and Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, if you want to read up more modernist, uh, modernist writers, and Pablo Picasso, if you want to take a look at a, a painter. Before moving on to postmodernism, I just wanted to mention that modernists generally were quite serious uh, about both what they were doing and also in the, their works. They deal with serious topics, some of them relating to, to war or because of the Great World War uh, or to, well, Virginia Woolf wrote some part of some books on, on suicide, etc. Uh, so it's serious and they want to be taken seriously and they want you to think and that is perhaps one of the things with, with uh, fragmentation and, and gaps. Uh, the World War included or people involved there started doubting and mistrusting authorities and because they had told you exactly what to think and to do and to start thinking for yourself and this is something that follows also in a more democratic line that you were supposed to think for yourself and looking at art or watching art or, or reading a novel you weren't supposed to be told everything you have to think for yourself and this is something that the modernists um, included. Let's move on to postmodernism. And uh, uh, Nietzsche, he wrote that there are no facts, there are only interpretations. Some people nowadays want to blame modern society in a sense, uh, in a way, on, on postmodernism to say, oh, there are no facts, we have only interpretations and <clears throat> we have uh, alternative facts, etc., etc. Uh, that is, in a way, to misconstrue or misunderstand um, postmodernism. What Nietzsche perhaps meant by this is that in art there are no facts, there are only interpretations. Um, so please don't misunderstand and misconstrue postmodernism here. Postmodernism is fun. Uh, some people want to say that postmodernism, in a sense, is modernism on steroids. It just blows everything up uh, in, well, 100 fold. Uh, it's supposed to be fun. Postmodernists perhaps say that the world is meaningless and we only have a very limited amount of time here on Earth. Uh, art cannot make sense of the world, so just play around with it. Uh, Postmodernism, just as modernism, wants you to think for yourself. And we can relate this to, to Nietzsche's uh, quote here, that we they don't mean anything with what they have done, postmodernist uh, art, for instance. Or they want you to think. You have everything in front of your eyes and you can interpret it in many different ways. It doesn't mean that you can make up anything you want at all. You still have what you see in front of you. You have to base your interpretation on that. And we can and we should interpret postmodernist works. Uh, and that is part of the fun. Uh, I have an example here of a postmodern piece of art. It's uh, The Treachery of Images by René Magritte, uh, and he painted this in uh, 1928-29. So postmodernism, it, it doesn't have to f be very far into the 20th century, but it follows mo modernism. And of course, uh, th this picture, uh, it says, Ceci n'est pas un pipe, uh, this is not a pipe. And we can see, well, it's a picture of a pipe, it looks like a pipe, 
but it isn't a pipe because of course it's just a picture and this is what uh, Magritte uh, meant with this because it's a picture of a pipe it's not a pipe but it is a pipe isn't it so he wanted us to, to start questioning and then thinking about this and the treachery of images that we can be fooled in a sense here comes a little postmodernist checklist Sometimes it's hard to differentiate between modernists and postmodernism. Uh, and it's not the end of the world if you, well, say that, well, he's a writing is modernist when it's actually postmodernist. But we can see some differences. What postmodernists love is breaking the rules of genre. Having a story, a film, a book, whatever, starting out following the rules of genre, let's say a comedy or a scary movie or something and you think as a viewer or reader that this or that uh, will happen because that's generally what happens in this genre uh, and then the writer or the director or whoever has done this just turns the whole table around and it turns out to be something completely different. Quentin Tarantino is a, is a director who does this quite a lot. Postmodernist love intertextuality and intertextuality can also be called pastiche or parody pastiche is not when you make fun of another uh, piece of work or, or characters i'm coming to what intertextual intertextuality is in a little while uh, but when you treat something older an older story or characters from a story for instance shakespeare and you, you treat it with uh, with respect when you treat it with respect it's called pastiche and when you treat it with disrespect um make fun of something it's called parody but both of them are inter intertextuality the tv series simpsons they used intertextuality a lot borrowing stories characters from other times uh, and if you want to see an example of this you can look at uh, link number one uh, here down below or you can just on youtube <coughs> and search for uh, for simpsons a clockwork yellow for instance when they have taken the story of a clockwork orange and they put the simpsons characters in there instead and they make fun of the story so that's an example of intertextuality another example of intertextuality is the um, film actually it's a play uh, called uh, rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead which is a tom stoppard uh, play based on the two very minor characters from uh, shakespeare's hamlet and the whole play is re regards their story instead another example of postmodernism is when you decenter a text decentering of a text uh, when you have the focus on the story or in the story uh, the focus is not on the protagonist or on the the main character in a sense but on a minor character um, for example uh, and we have an example in Quentin Tarantino's uh, Pulp Fiction, where the protagonist, the one who actually perhaps changes most in the story, uh, is the character played by Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, the focus is not entirely on him, but on a lot of other characters as well, and that's the decentering of text or film in this case. Postmodernists love playing around with words, and not in the serious modernist way of thinking, mm, what are words, but they go like, Whoa, what are words? It doesn't make sense. Uh, words can mean anything we want them to mean, and that is what the postmodernists do. Um, a wonderful example, or two wonderful examples of how postmodernists uh, play around with words uh, are, for instance, um, in um, uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's Everything is Illuminated, we have the character Alex, who is using words in a way that they perhaps weren't really meant to be used, but we understand completely what he means anyway. And the same goes for my personal favorite stand-up comedian, Eddie Izzard. And if you want to see an example of playing around with words, you can take a look at link number two down here uh, or search for Eddie Izzard on Latin. And that hopefully will give you a laugh. The last thing on my postmodernist checklist is metafiction. And metafiction sometimes is hard to see, but it's a way of the writers or director or whoever uh, to make you understand as a reader or a viewer that you are in fact reading a text. It calls attention to the fact that you are reading a text or watching a film. And if you want to see an example of how this can be used in film, uh, take a look at link number three down here or uh, search for um, Pulp Fiction don't be a square. There's a scene there where Mia and, uh, I forget his name, it doesn't matter, uh, they're sitting in a car and uh, Mia, the character Mia, uh, 
uh, tells him to not be a square and uh, when she says it a uh, square appears on the screen and you as a viewer perhaps should realize that you are watching a film you're not you're not supposed to feel that you're in the film you're you're actually watching it from the outside and that is what metafiction is about so there we have it modernism and postmodernism don't be afraid of reading especially in my sense i i love postmodernism don't be afraid of reading postmodern writers or watching postmodern films and remember it's supposed to be fun postmodernism that is and you're supposed to interpret things so go right ahead base everything you think every interpretation base it on things you can actually see or read uh, other ways you just making things up and you want to base it on something that you can actually to work with uh, if you want to continue working with postmodernism for instance you can take a look at my uh, lecture on how to write a literary analysis and there you will get more info on how to write a literary literary analysis of course uh, but also how to work with with the formulating a thesis a statement etc etc well i hope you've enjoyed this thank you very much